All right, welcome everyone. I can't see you, but I know you're out there. So uh, thanks for joining us on kind of a chilly night. It's, uh, it, you guys are even a little more north than I am. So it's probably even a few degrees colder where you are. Um, I just wanna say congrats to the Kenosha Public Library because um, this is part of a uh, series of programs that are sponsored by NASA at my library. And um, if I'm not mistaken, there were only a handful of libraries who got um, uh, approval for, for this kind of a series of programs. I know there were only two libraries in Illinois that were um, approved to do this. And I know a lot more than that applied. So congrats to you all for having a library um, willing to uh, uh, show you all about space. And so tonight, we're going to talk all about our solar system. It's where we live in the universe and there's some really awesome pictures out there. So my goal with this program is not to turn you into walking, talking astronomers. Um, if you just wanna sit back and watch the pretty pictures go by, that's cool. There are some amazing places in our solar system. Um, but I hope that I'm gonna tell you some info that you might find interesting, useful, um, inspiring. So maybe the next time you're at the library, you might pick up a book, a magazine, um, or another resource that might help you learn more. One resource that is located in your very own state of Wisconsin is Astronomy Magazine. They're based out of, I believe, Waukesha. And um, either that, uh, I believe it's Waukesha. And so um, if you wanna check that out, if the library doesn't have a subscription, I'll bet you they could help you figure out how to access one. And um, there's great information uh, every single month about neat things to see in the sky, uh, interesting astronomy related news, and uh, they have a great website as well, astronomy.com. So I just wanted to give a little shout out to a resource that's in your very own backyard. And it's a, it's a world, world known resource. So it's not just in uh, Wisconsin or in the Midwest area. But tonight's topic, solar system. Like I said, I'm gonna show some cool pictures. We're gonna start with our sun and work our way out. So I'm gonna share my screen. So give me my computer just a second to catch up with that. So give me a second and there we go. I think it's, it's sharing. So, okay. Now the picture that I've got up on the screen is kind of your typical, when you think solar system, you might see some sort of depiction like this, maybe in a textbook, a magazine, a website. Um, this is okay. It's, it's kind of showing planets to scale, not quite exactly right, but um, pretty close. Uh, they're shown somewhat to size scale, definitely not to distance scale. It's really difficult to put the size and distance of the planets to scale on the same piece of paper or the same uh, web uh, image. But what you've got is there's our sun shown at the left-hand side and you've got the planets, but there's so much more that we have in our solar system. I can't cover literally everything or we would be here till three weeks from now uh, if I did that. So I'm just gonna pick some highlights, some things that I at least find interesting that I hope you find interesting as well. And if you take a look at the stuff, the major stuff in our solar system, the sun, the planets, if you put them all to scale, you'd end up with something like this. So you see the big giant orange thing is the sun and all the little marbles to the right hand side are the planets. We'll get to the planets in just a sec, um, but I first want to focus on the sun. This is an image of the sun from a few months ago, and uh, the sun is the reason we're here. The sun gives us light and heat, energy. Um, we have plants on planet earth that use the sun. We have definitely a need for this star. It makes its own energy. That's the difference between a star and planets and everything else. Uh, a star makes its own energy. Planets reflect uh, light and heat from the sun. That little dark space that you see is called a sunspot. Now that really doesn't tell you anything about what a sunspot is. It, it tells you what a sunspot looks like. Um, when we first started pointing telescopes at the sun and could actually look at the sun safely, um, started seeing these darker areas and they look like spots. And so we called them sunspots 
and then later figured out what's going on with these sunspots. So let's take a close up look at one of these sunspots. This is a typical sunspot to scale. This is a real image. And you'll see the scale of the United States down there to the lower left. So a typical sunspot is about the size of planet Earth, if not even a little bigger. Now sunspots appear dark against the rest of the sun because sunspots are a little cooler than the rest of the sun. So they appear a little darker when we take pictures through our telescopes. Now sunspots are areas of the sun that are a little more active than, than uh, other areas of the sun. And so sometimes we have time, periods of time where we have more sunspots on the sun. Sometimes we have times when there are fewer sunspots on the sun. We're heading into a time period where we have more sunspots. Now the sun goes through cycles every nine to 14 years of more and fewer sunspots. So we had the fewest sunspots are the fewest in this particular most recent cycle a um, couple of years ago. And now we're heading toward uh, a maximum of spots on the sun. And so this picture was taken uh, again a couple months ago, but when we had a few more. So uh, we definitely have more and fewer in this, uh, this cycle happens over time. Now I mentioned those areas of the sun uh, where we have sunspots are a little more active than the rest. Sunspots are, can be pretty benign. They just sort of sit there. Um, the area of the sun uh, where the sunspots are, that, that area tends to cool off a little bit. And so again, I mentioned the temperature of those areas gets a little cooler. How much cooler are we talking? Well, the bright area of the sun that you see is at about 11,000 degrees. The cooler areas are at about maybe 7,000 degrees. Everything's relative, right? 7,000 is still pretty darn hot. Now, there are times when the sun puts off little, little bursts of energy. We call those flares, solar flares. This is a solar flare right here. They can last over the course of maybe a few minutes to a few hours. And when this material uh, goes outward, we can detect this. Uh, material and energy goes out where we can detect it with spacecraft and telescopes. But then there's time periods when the sun puts out a lot, a giant burst of energy and material. We call that a coronal mass ejection. Mass just refers to stuff. Ejection just means the sun lets loose. And coronal means this stuff goes outward through the, through the upper atmosphere of the sun. Now, what you're seeing is over the course of uh, a number of hours where the sun let off a huge burst of energy and the white that you're seeing all over the screen is radiation that absolutely overwhelmed the detectors, the telescopes, the cameras that took these images here. Now, when this energy, if it, if it happens to be pointing toward Earth and it interacts with Earth's magnetic field, we get uh, what we call auroras, the northern lights here uh, on planet Earth. And the more energetic this release, the, the farther south we will see um, the auroras. We tend to see them slightly less often than you do. Um, I'm in Aurora, um, coincidentally, uh, which is uh, west and a little bit south of Chicago. And uh, the farther north you go, especially up into Canada or Alaska, you'll see the northern lights much more often. And when we take a look at the planets, um, you can see that they kind of come in groups. We've got the two largest. So this one on the left, the largest one, that's Jupiter and Saturn. Then we call those the gas giants. They're not totally made of gas. It makes it sound like they're big gas balloons, and they're not. Um, they're, they're gaseous on the outside, liquid and kind of slushy in the middle. Uh, the two that are next largest, uh, the one on the left is Uranus. The one on the right is Neptune. And we call those the ice giants. They're gaseous on the outside and kind of icy slushy on the inside. And then the four smallest, we call those the terrestrial or the rocky planets. They're not made of totally made of rock. They're, they've got rock on the outside. It's basically a rocky surface that if you could travel to all these places, um, you can stand on that rocky surface. So it's, it's a surface that's hard. Um, and 
So we've got Earth is the largest rocky planet, then Venus, then Mars, then Mercury in terms of size. But in terms of distance from the sun, Mercury is our closest planet. So let's go there first. When you take a quick glance at Mercury, like a picture like this, it looks a lot like the moon. And one of the things you'll notice right away are all the circles that you see. We call those craters. Craters happen when something from space smashes into a surface and it makes a hole. Um, if it's a big thing or it hits a surface really hard, uh, going really quickly, you get a bigger hole. When it's something that is smaller, uh, that doesn't maybe hit quite so energetically, you get a smaller hole. And so these craters help scientists determine what has gone on on this surface. But not every opening that you see on a planet like this is a crater made from something that smacked it from space. We have volcanoes on all of the rocky planets. These volcanoes we don't think are active. We, have, we don't see signs that, that volcanoes on Mercury are still active, but this right here is a, a vent uh, uh, from a crater caused, this, this opening is caused by a volcano that used to erupt on Mercury. Now, when we take a look at these surfaces, I mentioned that we sometimes use craters to help us figure out what's going on, but that's not the only thing that we use. We can't travel to most of the stuff in the solar system. We can send our robots and our spacecraft and telescopes and things, but people can't go to these places. So I get asked a lot, how do we know what these places are like if we can't actually go there and say humans can't land here and scoop something up and figure out exactly what these surfaces are made of? Well, we can use the, the craters, that's one way, and we can also use light. What I mean by that is light from the sun shines down onto a surface, reflects off the surface. Light will reflect differently and show different patterns depending on what's there. A different material will reflect light differently and, and show different patterns as well. So let's take a look at this. Essentially think of this picture of Mercury as a paint by number picture of Mercury. What we've done is we have colorized the surface. Yellow indicates one type of rock. Blue indicates another type of rock. It actually doesn't matter what the types of rock are. That, that part isn't important for our discussion, but blue, one type of rock, yellow, a different type of rock. Let's see if we can figure out what happened on this particular splotch on Mercury. So what I can see is there's blue all around and there's kind of a yellowy color here. Again, these are not real colors. These are paint by number colors. NASA has said uh, blue is gonna tell us one type of rock and yellow is gonna tell us a different type of rock. So that's, that's what the colors signify. They could have picked any colors they wanted. Anyway, you take a look at some of these craters and they look blue. So likely what happened here is the blue rock, whatever that is, was there first. The yellow rock uh, um, erupted from a volcano and spread outward. And then some of these craters happened after because they punched through the, the whatever the yellow volcanic rock is to, the, to whatever rock was down below. And so you can see that reflected in how they've studied the light that has hit these rock types. And so with that, we can start to figure out what happened in this part of Mercury. So that just gives you a sense of how we can use all this information for places that we literally have not sent a robot to to go down on the surface and dig stuff up. Um, so we use the light that comes to us to study, to tell us what these places are made of. And we can do that all over the solar system. We also can use light that our eyes can't see to do the same thing. In this case, um, this is the North Pole area of Mercury. And what scientists did was they sent a different kind of light called radio light, use a radio telescope for that, send out radio waves out to uh, this part of Mercury. And depending on how they reflect back to us, 
that can tell us about the stuff that's there. In this case, they've colorized yellow, a certain type of material that you have in your house right now. And that material is ice, water ice. If you go in your freezer and you pull out an ice cube, you are holding the exact same stuff that we find in some of the craters on the planet Mercury. Now think about that for a second. We're talking about the closest planet to the sun. We're talking about an, uh, the planet where the side that faces the sun is at 800 degrees. The side that faces away from the sun is 200 degrees below zero. How do you get ice being able to stick around on a planet where the temperature can be as much as 800 degrees? Well, the answer is this is at the poles. So the sun in some cases doesn't get high enough in the sky to reach, to have sunlight reach the floors of these deep craters. And so if ice collects in those craters, it'll stick around, it won't go anywhere because it just, it doesn't get sunlight there. It doesn't get warm enough to make the ice go away. And so we have water ice, again, same stuff that's in your freezer, on craters or inside craters, uh, dark craters on the surface of Mercury at the poles. So it's kind of cool that we can look out and see many very similar materials as we have here on Earth. We see them elsewhere in the solar system. Next planet from the sun is Venus. Now, I mentioned the temperature on Mercury gets up to about 800 degrees. Even though Venus is farther from the sun than Mercury is, it's the hottest planet. The main difference between Venus and Mercury is Venus has a very, very thick, dense, cloudy atmosphere. That atmosphere acts like a blanket to trap the heat from the sun. And over time, this has happened to such a degree that the temperature on Venus is not only 800 degrees, it's almost 900 degrees. That's hotter than the clean setting on your oven. If you, if you have to your oven, you can set it to the clean setting to get rid of any burnt on, baked on stuff on the inside of your oven. That can get up to several hundred degrees. Well, the surface of Venus is even hotter. The surface of Venus is hot enough to melt lead. Not only that, the, what you're looking at is clouds. Those clouds are not the same puffy water vapor clouds that we have here. They're made of sulfuric acid. So you have this thick, dense, crushing atmosphere with clouds made of battery acid with a temperature hot enough to melt lead. Venus is not a place to think about going on vacation. Now, if you strip away those clouds, we can use radar um, sent from Earth and also on spacecraft. Uh, so we have the ability to uh, send a spacecraft to Venus, it orbits, sends radar waves down to the surface and how they bounce off the surface tells us what the surface is like. So even though the United States has not sent spacecraft to the surface of Venus, I didn't say no one has, but the US hasn't. Um, the way that we can tell what the entire surface is like is we use radar. And the key to radar images, this is a radar image. And the key to radar images is if you see brightly colored areas on a radar image, it means the surface is rough and bumpy. If you see dark on a radar image, like this area over here, it means the surface is fairly flat. That'll come into play in uh, other images I'm gonna show you. But you can see areas that, that if you didn't know that the temperature was 900 degrees or almost, you'd almost swear those looked like rivers, right? But those, we don't think those are rivers, well, they're definitely not rivers of water. Those may very well be rivers of lava or ancient lava flows on the surface of Venus. We are certain that Venus has volcanoes. We don't know for certain that they still erupt. We think they do, but we haven't yet had the ability to detect erupting volcanoes on Venus. We hope that will change in the next few years, um, but uh, we don't truly know if the volcanoes on Venus are active. Now, I mentioned that Venus has been visited by spacecraft 
that the US has not sent spacecraft to the surface of Venus. However, the Soviet Union, uh, so the, the country currently known as Russia, used to be known as the Soviet Union, and it used to be made of what is currently Russia plus other republics that, um, uh, that were part of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union sent several spacecraft between the 1960s and the 1980s to the surface of Venus. The one that lasted the longest lasted about two hours, but they did successfully send pictures back from the surface. This is one of those pictures. And it's kind of neat because you look out and if you didn't know what you were looking at, you'd almost think, wow, they stuck a spacecraft model at, uh, at maybe the, the volcanoes in Hawaii because that's exactly what that looks like. Uh, it looks a lot, a lot like volcanic rock. But what you're seeing at the bottom is a portion of the spacecraft. I believe this little bit right here was the cover on the camera, I think. Um, but you can also see off in the distance, the sky is pretty bright. You won't see the sun directly because of all those clouds. Uh, but a cloudy day on Venus is just, is gonna look like a bright cloudy day uh, on Earth. So think of, uh, Think of a day on Earth when the sun, you can't see it, but you know it's there because the, the sky is still pretty bright during the day. That's, that's kind of what this looks like. Here's another one um, for, from a different, uh, uh, different set of pictures. So this is kind of looking a little familiar, right? Again, looking like volcanic rock does on planet Earth. So NASA is going to send two more spacecraft to Venus. We've, we've not shown Venus really much, much love at all um, over the last 30 years. The last time we sent a spacecraft though was, uh, was called Magellan um, about 30 years ago. And so there'll be two more spacecraft uh, that will be sent there sometime. I believe they'll be ready to go maybe in the late 2020s or so. Uh, so we will learn more about Venus then. I'm not gonna spend much time on Earth and Moon, but I want to show you Earth specifically. Look at how different the Earth looks compared to everything else you're gonna see in this talk. Earth is the only planet that we know of that has liquid water on its surface, the only planet with life on the surface. That green color especially is the unmistakable sign of life. That blue color is the unmistakable sign of liquid water. You will not see that combination anyplace else uh, that we know of in our solar system. So I just wanted to point that out. And when we take a look at our moon, our moon looks pretty dry and desolate um, when we compare it to planet Earth. But just like I showed you for Mercury, there are, there's water ice in some of the craters at the poles uh, on Mercury. The same is true for our moon. Our moon has water ice at the poles in deep shadowed craters. Maybe we can use this ice sometime in the future when we send people back to the surface of the moon, um, which probably won't happen before the year 2025, um, but NASA will be testing the rocket system uh, that will begin to take us back to the moon. Uh, sometime in the next year or so, uh, we'll get the next test of uh, a brand new rocket, which, would, which should be pretty fun. It's called Artemis. Um, so I'm looking forward to those tests. Looking a little farther out, the next planet from the sun is Mars. And it looks pretty strikingly different from, uh, especially from Earth. But that uh, reddish color that you see is uh, there's there's a lot of iron in there, are iron bearing minerals in the surface in the dust um, on Mars. But if you take a look at these splotches over here on the left hand side, there are quite a few we think extinct volcanoes on the surface of Mars. Some large ones and a bunch of small ones. And so this is something that's common to the rocky planets and even some moons in our solar system to have volcanoes. Uh, again, we think the, the volcanoes on Mercury are, or uh, excuse me, on Mars are extinct just as they are on Mercury. Now, when we started sending spacecraft into orbit around Mars, um, uh, if I just kept saying Mercury, I think I was. 
I apologize for that. Mars, we are on planet Mars right now. So anyway, when we first started sending spacecraft to Mars uh, in the early 1970s was when we first started sending them into orbit around Mars. We started studying the entire surface and we started seeing signs that the way Mars looks now may not have been how Mars was in the distant past. You don't have to be a geologist to know, just have a sense of what this feature looks like. It looks like a dried river. We started seeing signs that Mars used to be wet on the surface. Indeed, if we take a look at the ice that's there now, and just like we have on, Mer on Mercury, just like we have on Earth, just like we have on our moon, just like we have elsewhere in the solar system, Mars has water ice on the surface and under the surface right now. If you melt all that ice that we, that we know is there and that we strongly uh, uh, think is there, it would, you would end up with being able to cover the entire planet of Mars in a layer of water 115 feet thick. That's a lot of water. But Mars used to be wet. Where did that water go? We don't 100% know. Um, but when we started looking for signs of liquid water on, the, uh, on Mars in the past, we started seeing signs everywhere. First off, this is um, a picture taken by the Mars Phoenix spacecraft. It was close to 15 years ago. It landed closer to the North Pole of Mars. But if you see all these um, sort of uh, little, little bits, they're not round, but they're, they kind of look like they have a, uh, a little channel around them. Uh, we see these features on Earth. When you have repeated changes in temperature, uh, freezing and uh, freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing, we see this on Earth, especially more near the poles. And this area on Earth we call tundra, and it's areas where they have what's called permafrost, permanently frozen under the surface. We see this on Mars as well. So you just look at that picture and you go, huh, is there ice under the surface here? Well, the Mars Phoenix spacecraft had a scoop on it and it could scoop down into the dust. And what did we see? Ice under the surface, about two inches down. So this again is water ice, same stuff that's in your freezer. You see little chips of it in the trench right here. Four days later, we don't see those chips. The ice vaporized in that four days. It was exposed and vaporized. And so um, you can see, and here's the chips right here and they're not visible. Uh, four days later. So there's definitely water ice under a vast amount of the surface of Mars. But when we look at other areas of Mars, this stuff right here, this was churned up by one of the Spirit rover's wheels. That whitish colored stuff that you see is a mineral called silica. This mineral is in such a high concentration here that we think that liquid water was involved in concentrating this stuff. We think that this part of Mars that you're looking at right here in this picture used to be a hot spring, probably somewhere in their neighborhood of about 3 billion years ago. That's a long time ago, but still, there used to be liquid water at this place on Mars. The Opportunity rover took a look and it found this stuff, this lighter colored stuff is a mineral called calcium sulfate. Um, if, you, if that name doesn't ring a bell, it's okay, uh, but you have come across this stuff. So if, let's say, now, if there's any kids in the audience, kids don't do this. Mom and dad, if you happen to ever have been nailing a, a hole in your wall, and you're nailing and oops, you, you hit the hammer, it, it slides off and, and hits the drywall and maybe breaks through the paper and you see that crumbly stuff underneath, that's calcium sulfate. Another word for that is gypsum. And uh, another type of calcium sulfate is called plaster of Paris. If you have plaster walls in your house, same stuff. That's what this stuff is. How do you get this? 
hot minerally water flows through cracks in rocks and the water goes and dries and it leaves the minerals behind. That's what this is. This is a gypsum plaster of Paris calcium sulfate vein in a rock on Mars. Same stuff that's in your walls, either plaster walls or drywall walls, same thing. It's pretty cool if you think about it. Now this picture is taken by the Curiosity rover. And the picture on the right is rounded rocks in a dried stream on Earth in Chile. The picture on the left is rounded rocks all stuck together in a dried stream on Mars. This dried stream was probably there about 3 billion years ago. This was flowing fresh water. If you were on this place on Mars uh, and you walked out into this stream, it would have been about knee deep. You could have taken a glass, just like this one I'm holding here. You could have dipped it down into the stream and drunk the water. This is fresh water and um, uh, on this place on Mars. And we can probably relate to this picture here. This is dried mud on Mars. So a little farther away from where the Curiosity rover took the last picture, um, that's where it took this one. Imagine pools of water in this place uh, called Gale Crater and streams might have been running down the sides of the crater and the water pooled from time to time and then the water dried from time to time. And it almost looks like this dried mud was, was made a few weeks ago. This dried mud was made on Mars about 3 billion years ago. Um, but it, it, it looks just like you see dried mud looking here uh, on planet Earth. So pretty cool to see that. Now this picture is where the Perseverance rover is on Mars. And this is called Jezero Crater. And this is a portion of Jezero right here. The rover landed right around here um, in the crater. And what you see is a dried river leading to a river delta, and it kind of fans out. And we think the, the river fed into the crater, and it, the water probably filled up the crater at, what, at one point. And so the rover was sent here to study the rocks to figure out if that's really true, um, if we could find evidence that liquid water uh, interacted with the rocks here. And um, in about a week, there will be some science results released, the first uh, batch of science results released from the rover. So uh, I don't know what they're going to talk about. Um, so we'll see what the uh, science results are that we've gotten so far from this rover. This is pretty exciting. It landed in February and it's December and we get uh, our first science from the rover. So I'm looking forward to that. In between Mars and Jupiter, we have a bunch of rocks. And uh, some of these rocks are maybe a quarter of a mile wide up to this one, which is several hundred miles wide. These are called asteroids. And there are over, uh, there's several hundred thousand asteroids that we know of. And this is the largest one, it's called Ceres. It's the only one that's round. If you're wondering how stuff gets round in the solar system, uh, by round, I mean something has enough mass, enough stuff to have enough gravity to pull it into a round shape. If you're not made of enough stuff, gravity isn't strong enough to pull you into a round shape. You have to be big enough to then be pulled into a round shape. And that's how this thing got round. Now, Ceres is a really interesting asteroid because we think there is a lot of water ice underneath the surface. This is a computer generated map of where we think the water ice is. The blue indicates uh, where we think the water ice is under the surface. Um, not only that, we think Ceres has ice volcanoes. So they don't emit liquid melted rock. They emit, emit ice. And so uh, we're pretty sure that this particular uh, asteroid is active with volcanoes, maybe not active now, but uh, active in the somewhat recent past in our solar system. 
But other asteroids aren't quite so big, and so they're not made of enough stuff to pull them into a round shape. And so this is one of those. This is called Vesta. I believe Vesta is only about 200 miles in diameter, so not big enough to pull it into a round shape. Um, so it's kind of lumpy like a potato. And then you take a look and see some of these other potato looking asteroids. And these are called Ida and Dactyl. Ida is the big one. Dactyl is the little one. Dactyl is a moon of Ida, a satellite of Ida. And so a moon is not exclusive to planets. Planets are not the only things that have moons. Moon just means satellite. A satellite is something that orbits something else. And so you can have satellites orbit uh, asteroids. And so that's what this is here. And this one is called Lutetia. This one is called Itakawa. Itakawa, I like to bring up this one because if any of you have ever visited the museum campus uh, in Chicago, we've got uh, three major museums there, the Adler Planetarium, the Field Museum, and the Shedd Aquarium. If you brought asteroid Itakawa to the museum campus, one end of it, would be at the Adler Planetarium. The other end of it would be at the Field Museum. You can fit Itakawa between the Adler Planetarium and the Field Museum. We're not that far apart. Um, and so Itakawa is not that big of an asteroid. It's a barely held together rubble pile. It almost looks like you could just walk up to it and kick it and it would fly apart. Um, that wouldn't happen, but uh, the closer you look to the surface of this asteroid, you see rubble on top of rubble on top of rubble. And we see this with other asteroids too. This is asteroid Rugu. And again, you keep looking at this thing and you just see rocks and rocks and more rocks. Here's another one called Bennu. Again, rocks and rocks and rocks. This, uh, the last one, Rugu, uh, bit little tiny uh, bits of it were uh, samples were returned to Earth by a spacecraft without people on it, uh, but they were recently returned to Earth. Um, so scientists have been studying those samples. This one, uh, asteroid Bennu, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft grabbed some pieces of this asteroid and are returning those pieces to Earth, and they will come back to Earth in the year 2023. Um, this, this uh, spacecraft will take kind of a, a long looping uh, path to get back to Earth. But again, if you take a, a close up look, it just is rock on top of rock on top of rock. So we're looking forward to getting the material back from this asteroid to be able to learn more about it. Farther out, we have the giant planets. Jupiter is the giantest of the giant planets and this is a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is one of Jupiter's moons called Europa. Uh, Jupiter is very colorful. It has uh, very distinct bands of clouds. Even looking at these, uh, at this planet, you can see these bands, some of these bands with a small telescope. Excuse um, me? Yes. How much moons does Jupiter have? That's a great question. And I often forget because we keep finding them. I believe the current number is 79. Do me a favor, remind me at the end and I will look that up for you just to check. Um, but I believe Jupiter's number is currently 79. But I'll okay. double check because like I said, they keep finding them, um, which is great but annoying because it's hard to keep up. <laughs> So okay. we'll get back to that. So do me a favor. Um, I, I know that there's a question in the chat. I haven't been able to look at it. Do me a favor, put in the chat, look up number of Jupiter's moons and that'll remind me. All right. So we've got cloud bands. The colors are due to uh, the, the different uh, chemical reactions that are going on here. So the different colors tell you about what's going on. And all of these swirls and cloud patterns, these are all real. These are real pictures of Jupiter. Um, it almost looks like what, uh, when, you, when you pour some cold coffee creamer into your hot coffee. Um, and actually you can do that experiment and see what happens. You'll probably get patterns that look a lot like this. You've got warmer areas down below, colder areas up above and all this stuff swirls around. Again, this is a close up image of some of these swirling clouds. And they really do look like this. This is a true color picture uh, or close to it of, uh, of Jupiter's clouds. 
again, we've got another one, a, a swirling mass of clouds. And the, we've got different temperatures that are causing these swirling clouds as well. So Jupiter, again, I mentioned, is probably a slushy, rocky interior. Um, Jupiter has, I think, 79 moons. We'll check that. And some of them can uh, go into the volcano realm, just like I mentioned before, specifically this one right here. This is Jupiter's moon Io or Eo. Um, Eo has about 400 volcanoes on its surface and many of them are active. Uh, Jupiter's gravity pushes and pulls on this moon, squeezing it and pulling it. And it basically squishes the interior, heats it up over and over and over. And then you've got the, the volcanoes that erupt. The colors are because these moons are, or this, uh, these volcanoes are not spitting out hot melted rock uh, necessarily. They're spitting out hot molten sulfur. And the different colors that you see are the different temperatures of sulfur. Black is the hottest temperature of sulfur. And uh, then you get into the cooler temperatures with the oranges and the yellows and stuff. How do we know that these volcanoes are active? One of them at least did us the favor of erupting when one of our spacecraft was passing by. That's what you're seeing here. This is not a faked image. This is a real one of an actual erupting volcano on the surface of Io. And it's spewing this sulfur and other material out uh, into space that's crashing down on the surface. These pictures here are actually also real erupting, uh, a real erupting volcano on the surface of Io, um, which I think is just amazing. It isn't just, oh, we think this was active uh, a billion years ago. We think this is active now and we can see this happening. So you've got fire for one of the moons, we have ice for many of the other moons. Here's an example of that. This is Jupiter's moon Europa. It's covered in, in a thick crust of ice. And that's what all the cracking is that you see. The whole thing is ice. And it's also probably covered in, in a layer of uh, this kind of reddish colored material. It's kind of dusty material. You can see here's a crater right here, probably a newer one. Here's a crater over here, but you don't see a lot of craters. And the reason for that is the ice keeps shifting and moving. And so it kind of erases some of the craters over time. And if you uh, uh, take a look at many other places, many other moons in our solar system, especially the farther you get from the sun, the more you see ice. We'll come back to that in a second. Saturn is the next planet out. I believe the number of moons for Saturn is 82. Um, if, if I've got the current number right. And uh, Saturn looks a lot like Jupiter. It's slightly smaller. The chemistry going on here is a little different. So you'll see the colors look a little different. The cloud bands aren't quite as colorful. Um, and also the, the clouds are covered in a layer of haze. And so you don't quite see the cloud bands quite as well as you see uh, on, in the pictures of Jupiter. The rings of Saturn are very bright. They're made of water ice. Again, same stuff that you see in your freezer. And uh, all the giant planets have rings, but Saturn's rings are the ones that are brightest because they are, it, it has the, the most amount of ice. Here's another image of, of Saturn. This one was taken about a year ago. Um, so the last picture was taken about three years ago. This one was taken about a year ago. And we check it out every, every year or so to be able to see what kind of changes we see in Jupiter's atmosphere, what the storms are doing, what the clouds are doing, what the rings are doing, what the moons are doing. This is a real picture. It was taken by a spacecraft that used to be there. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. It's called Cassini. And this picture was taken by, by sunlight passing through Saturn's rings. And you can see the shadow of the rings on the surface of the clouds, uh, on the exterior of the clouds. But the rings aren't solid. They're not, they're not a single thing. They're made of lots and lots and lots of chunks of ice. And in some cases, they're, they're pretty thin so that light can pass right through them. You can see that 
some of these are so thin that uh, the shadow just isn't that dark. Some images of some of these clouds um, in, uh, in Saturn's cloud tops. But again, you can see through the rings to be able to see the, the tops of the clouds beyond. Now, if you wanna see what the rings look like close up, here is one of my favorite pictures of Saturn's rings. And this is sunlight shining uh, from this, in this case, from the top of the picture downward, but it's shining onto some of the ring material, which has popped up a little higher than the rest. And you can see the shadows of some of the ring material on the rest of the rings beyond. I love that because they, they really are three-dimensional and you can see that. But how thick are Saturn's rings? Well, if we go back to the picture of the planet, from one side of the rings to the other, you could stick Earth on one side and our moon on the other. So those rings are wide, but they're only on average about 30 feet thick. So find a three-story building in Kenosha. That'll tell you approximately how thick from, from bottom to top, how thick Saturn's rings are. In other words, not very. <laughs> Saturn also has very interesting moons. I picked out this one um, because it's really neat. It has, it's called Enceladus. It has ice geysers spewing ice out into space. And you can see that this is ice that is uh, in a cloud around um, approximately where these geysers are. And you can see the geysers right here. You can see them in a line um, right here, spewing ice into space. Those are from cracks in the icy surface of Enceladus and there's liquid water underneath, we think. Um, so that's a really neat place. Then there's this place. This is not Saturn. This is Saturn's moon, Titan. Titan has an atmosphere. Its atmosphere is denser than Earth's atmosphere. There was a spacecraft that landed here. Um, it was about 15 or so years ago. And these are basically two of the same images, but what you're seeing is uh, rounded rocks. Uh, but these rocks aren't made of rock, they're made of ice. These are ice boulders. They look huge, but in reality, if I'm not mistaken, this one right here, I think you can see my arrow. This one here is only about four inches across. So not that big, but they're rounded. There's a reason they're rounded. I mentioned a dried stream on Mars, right? You remember the rounded rocks there? Remember that, I'll come back to that in just a sec. So this image right here is showing you a feature on Titan, but I want you to pay attention first to where my arrow is. You can kind of see, it almost looks like smoke across the surface. Um, those are clouds appearing and disappearing over this feature right here. And you can see that feature kind of extends a little farther out. It looks kind of dark. Well, let's take a close up look at this feature right here and find out more about that. That's this right here. And if you can, you can kind of see there's kind of the shape right here. So it's actually this, this uh, area of Titan right here. So this is a radar image. Remember what I said for Venus? If you see uh, a bright area on a radar image, it means it's a very bumpy surface. If you see a dark area on a radar image, it's a very flat surface. What you're seeing is a lake on the surface of Titan. This is not a water lake. This is a lake of a material, two materials called ethane and methane. And it's so cold on the surface of Titan that any, any water would be in the form of ice. But this material, these materials, ethane and methane can be liquid at that temperature. We're talking like close to 300 degrees below zero. It's pretty chilly here, but take a look. I don't know about you. I don't have to know too much about what's going on here. That's a river. These are rivers. These are streams. These are streams of liquid ethane and methane flowing into a liquid ethane and methane lake. We have liquid ethane and methane rain on Titan in the atmosphere that falls down onto the surface, flows downward from hills and, 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 and all that through valleys into this lake. 
Now this lake is also really interesting because you can see these dark areas, right? Pretty flat, not much going on there. You see this bit right up here near the top where it looks a little bit bright? What you're seeing are waves on the surface of the lake. The air is blowing, the wind is blowing in, uh, in this atmosphere. It's blowing across the surface of the lake of ethane and methane and it's causing waves which appear bumpy, therefore brighter on this radar image. You can kind of see it in other areas of the lake as well. So just like Lake Michigan, you go down to Lake Michigan, you see some, so you got some wind blowing across the lake, you get the waves. Same thing going on here. It's just the lake is made of different stuff than what you're used to, but the process is still the same. I love this picture. This is. Again, I have lots of favorites in the solar system. This is one of my very favorite pictures because it's totally something we all can relate to. All right, I'm not gonna spend much time on Uranus and Neptune. Um, and the reason for that is we don't know a huge amount about Uranus and Neptune. Um, there's only been one spacecraft that has ever visited here. Um, and that is the Voyager 2 in the 1980s. And we haven't sent anything else to go explore these planets uh, since then. So Uranus, this is about as interesting as Uranus gets, <laughs> which is not very. Um, Uranus is tipped over, it has rings. Uh, it's, the rings are very dark. Um, again, we don't know a lot about what's going on here. Um, this is a couple of pictures that were taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, if you're wondering. Neptune, again, not a huge amount of information about this planet. Um, the atmosphere of Neptune has these dark storms uh, that we see them appear and disappear over time. So it kind of looks like Jupiter and Saturn, just a different color. And that blue color is due to methane in the atmosphere. Neptune has a really interesting moon called Triton. Not its only moon, but it's an interesting moon. If you take a look, some of the surface looks like a cantaloupe. Um, that's exactly what that looks like. But if you take a look down here at the bottom, you can kind of see some dark streaks. These are dust deposits from ice volcanoes, small ice geysers uh, blowing off uh, from the interior of Triton. So it's an active kind of moon. Pretty neat. Um, you can see that actually happening. And just talking a bit about what is farther from Neptune, of of course, we have to talk about Pluto. And yes, if you want to call Pluto a planet, you can call it a planet. You won't hurt my feelings by doing that. This is a true color picture of Pluto. We can see darker, rough surfaces. We can see an icy, smooth surface right here. Um, we can see this icy, smooth area right here. We can see water ice mountains here. These mountains are about as tall as at least as the Appalachians, and in some cases, as tall as some of the shorter Rocky Mountains. So imagine the Rocky Mountains, but not just covered in ice, made of ice, completely made of ice. And that's what this is right here, water ice mountains um, poking up from uh, the surface of Pluto. Pluto's largest moon, Charon. Um, again, just showing you a really interesting looking place with a canyon that stretches at least a uh, thousand miles, if not more. We think this probably stretches around to the backside of the moon, but we don't know what the backside of the moon actually looks like. Um, but still really neat place in our solar system. And Pluto has five moons in total. Charon is the largest. And then these other four are very small. Um, Charon is about 750 miles wide. These moons are like 10 to 20 miles wide, something like that. Um, just uh, pretty, pretty tidy places. And then farther out from Pluto, we have a lot of other worlds. Some have names, some don't. You can see they're round. We have uh, um, places that are farther out that look a lot like Pluto. This one called Eris seems to be made of very similar stuff as, as Pluto is. But you can see they've colorized these 
these are artists' pictures. These are not actual pictures of any of these except for Pluto and Karen. But they've colorized them based on what we think the colors look like uh, on the surfaces of these worlds. They go from gray to rather reddish, which is pretty neat to see. And then finally, comets. Comets are leftovers from the formation of the solar system, and we've seen a few of them up close. Comets are mostly made of ices and dust and rock. Asteroids are made mostly of rock and dust with some ice, sometimes none, sometimes some. Um, but comets are mostly ices and rock and dust. And so we've got these three, Comet Vilt 2, Comet Borelli, and Comet Halley. This one, Comet Hartley. And then finally, Comet 67P, where if you're going, wait a minute, 67P, what's the name of this one? Comet Churyumov Gerasimenko, and that is a mouthful. So I will just call it Comet 67P, which is its other name. Um, but these comets, like I said, are leftovers from the formation of this whole entire solar system. So they're very icy places. Um, and so really neat stuff in our solar system, everything from hottest places in our solar system to iciest places in our solar system and everything in between. And I promise to look up the number of moons of Jupiter. So let me look that up right now. Total number of moons of Jupiter. And the answer is, let's see, it looks like uh, 53 named moons. So 53 have names, another 26 awaiting official names. So that means 79 total. There you go. I know, 79. I can tell you, isn't that crazy? Yes, and how many do we have? One. <laughs> and how many do Mercury and Venus have? Zero. Mars has two, Jupiter has 79, Saturn has 82, Uranus has, I believe, 29, Neptune has, I think, I think 16, I think, don't quote me on that. And uh, Pluto has five and there are a handful of other worlds out past Pluto that also have moons, at least one or two. All right.